Donald Barry was a poor man's James Cagney, short in stature, standing five foot four, intense in style. He should have moved into better things, but the same qualities that made him successful on the screen was part of his overall makeup, and he wound up alienating both cast and crew. And because of that, he was never able to fully make it out of B-films, and as they disappeared, Barry, used to being a leading man, would struggle just to put groceries on the table. He was born in 1912 as Donald Barry DaCosta. Despite his diminutive size, he played college football and did quite well. He then became a stage actor, moving to the screen for a one-shot deal, playing the part of a student in one of Cecil B. DeMille's lesser-known films, This Day and Age, made in 1933. The star was Charles Bickford, at the time known as one of Hollywood's rebels, as testified by the title of his autobiography, Bulls, Balls, Bicycles, and Actors. He would later become famous for the kindly old man roles incongruous to his real personality. Also in the cast was Ben Alexander, later to become famous as Officer Frank Smith on the Dragnet series, and Fuzzy Knight, who would become a TV sidekick of Buster Crabbe. Barry wouldn't appear on the screen again until 1936 when he landed a small role in an RKO bottom half feature called Night Waitress. Margot Graham, who had recently appeared in John Ford's Oscar-winning The Informer, and Gordon Jones, who would later become famous for his role as Mike the Cop on The Abbott and Costello Show, would star in this film. This murder mystery featured Barry as an early victim and also featured an early appearance by Frank Phelan, the dad on TV's Dobie Gillis, who played a cop, and Anthony Quinn, who played a gangster. And while we're on the subject of John Ford, those familiar with his work will remember the song The Monkeys Have No Tails in Tambawanga, used in both They Were Expendable and Donovan's Reef. Well, that tune made its debut here. For the next few years, Barry would bounce around, grabbing whatever work he could. He had a small role in the classic Dead End. He played an intern. He also played a doctor in several of the Lou Ayres Dr. Kildare entries at MGM. He was a football player in Navy Blue and Gold, a film that starred James Stewart, Robert Young, and Lionel Barrymore. And to show he was an equal opportunity service actor, he appeared in The Duke of West Point, which starred Louis Hayward. One of his most famous parts was in Howard Hawke's Only Angels Have Wings. Barry played Tex the lookout who was constantly relaying weather information to star Cary Grant's pilots who tried to navigate their way through a difficult mountain pass. While all of Barry's performance was photographed in a lonely cabin, his voice quality and variations made an impression. Shortly afterwards, Barry got his break. Republic Pictures, looking for a short, intense actor out of the James Cagney mode, hired Barry for a Three Musketeers western called Wyoming Outlaw. The film starred John Wayne as Stony Brook. Barry played Will Parker, a good man driven to the wrong side of the law. Barry made such a good impression that he got more Republic Western work. He played Roy Rogers' brother in Saga of Death Valley and appeared with Rogers in Days of Jesse James. Barry played the legendary outlaw as a heroic figure and Rogers' pal in this one. Barry would play James again in a later film. He then got his big break portraying Red Ryder in the Republic serial of the same name. Made in an era in which Republic made some of their finest work, this chapter play was a fast-moving, exciting serial full of the elements that directors John English and William Whitney, along with special effects masters Howard and Theodore Lydecker, used successfully. Unfortunately, Barry's intensity and conceit that made him popular on the screen made him just as unpopular off it. He fought with Whitney in English, two of the most even-tempered men and fastest workers in Hollywood. In fact, Whitney would call him the midget, and English refused to work with him again. Despite the fact that Barry made his name with Red Ryder, he felt he was miscast. The comic book Red Ryder was tall and lanky. Barry was short and stocky. And as an aside, Red Ryder might have been one of those cast-aside heroes of the 40s had it not been for humorous Gene Shepard, who wrote about his boyhood wish to have a Red Ryder BB gun as a Christmas gift. The story would become the classic A Christmas Story, a staple for holiday viewing. Barry's westerns made money. His small stature usually suggested some kind of kid role, like Ghost Valley Riders, where he played the Toulouse kid, and Two-Gun Sheriff, where he played the Sundown kid. 
He played the Cyclone Kid, the Sombrero Kid, the Tulsa Kid, the Apache Kid, the West Side Kid, the Chicago Kid. Yeah, that was a non-Western. And yes, he did play Billy the Kid, but not for Republic. That would be for Lippert Pictures. By that time, due to his success as Red Rider, Barry changed his screen name to Donald Red Barry, a name he used only for his Republic Pictures appearances. Occasionally, Barry would get work in films other than Westerns. He went over to Fox for the vastly underrated The Purple Heart, where he played one of eight Air Force flyers captured after Jimmy Doolittle's raid over Tokyo. The Lewis Milestone film starred Dana Andrews, Richard Conti, Sam Levine, and Farley Granger as other members of that crew. But it was back to the Cowboys and Indians, and usually to the beautiful Lynn Merrick as his co-star. They did make 14 films together before Ms. Merrick moved to Columbia. In 1940, Barry married another Republic star, Peggy Stewart. And although both specialized in the Western genre, they never made a film together. The B-Western cycle was winding down in the late 40s. And like many cowboy heroes, Red Barry was falling out of fashion. Republic tried him in a couple of crime dramas and a musical comedy. They were misfires. Barry would move to Lippert in 1949. With boxing films like Champion, Body and Soul, and The Setup, Lippert felt that this pugnacious Barry would make a good hero in their boxing effort called Ringside, more reminiscent of the Clifford Odette's Golden Boy. His next Lippert effort was made for his own production company. It was a Western called The Dalton Gang. Barry established a good cast with the likes of Robert Lowry, James Milliken, and George J. Lewis. The company would make four more films, a musical western called Square Dance Jubilee with Mary Beth Hughes, which was followed by a modern western, Tough Assignment, and finally two more straight westerns, Gunfire and Train to Tombstone, both with Robert Lowry. In fact, Barry and Lowry combined for five films together in their Lippert years. He thought he hit bottom after playing second fiddle to Judy Canova, then appeared in a strange Mickey Rooney film called My Outlaw Brother with Roberts Preston and Stack, and an even stranger Rooney film, A Twinkle in God's Eye, a film which Rooney produced. He directed a film called Jesse James Woman, once again playing Jesse opposite Peggy Castle. He spent the next quarter century where he began, doing bits in a lot of films and making appearances on the tube. He would appear in I'll Cry Tomorrow, which would get Susan Hayward an Academy Award nomination, and Seven Men From Now, another underrated Western starring Randolph Scott and Lee Marvin, directed by the veteran Bud Bedecker and produced by John Wayne. This film has been rediscovered recently and has become a cult classic. He appeared in the Rat Pack version of Ocean's Eleven, and found work in producer A.C. Lyle's retro westerns made in the 60s with heroes from the 40s. The closest thing to steady work Barry got was a reoccurring role as Lieutenant Snedeker in the 60s television series Surfside 6 about three young Miami Beach detectives played by Troy Donahue, Van Williams, and Lee Patterson. This was a Miami Beach version of the popular 77 Sunset Strip. Despite the lack of public recognition... Barry seemed to have gotten his personal life in order. He remarried, had two children, and while his work usually went unnoticed, it did put groceries on the table. Donald Barry had a huge body of work, 139 films, 88 more television appearances. He was both a big fish in a small pond and a small fish in a big pond. And despite his reputation off the screen, he never gave a bad performance on it. But life takes cruel turns, and it did for Donald Barry. On July 17, 1980, he shot himself to death. He was 68. 